Welcome to this Baha 4 collaborative worship service. Whenever you are joining us, wherever you are worshiping from, you are welcome to bring your whole self here now. We are the Baha 4, representing Unitarian Universalists across Southeastern Arizona. We come together as the Baha 4 because we know we are stronger together. We represent Borderlands Unitarian Universalist, Sky Island Unitarian Universalist, Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson. Today is the beginning of a new worship theme. In the coming month, we will be exploring some of the fake fights and taboos of our congregations and our larger culture. The origins of the word taboo arise from Polynesian culture, a reminder that our American culture, held in common here, is actually drawn from many sources. The meaning of taboo in English is something that is set apart or forbidden. In the coming weeks, we will be bringing our curiosity to engage with subjects that are often carefully avoided in conversation. This might sound like a daunting theme for worship, but it is actually something we engage in a small way every week already. Our UU principles guide us to the importance of searching for the truth, even when it is buried under cultural taboos. Each week we begin our worship service by naming the ongoing effect on indigenous peoples of America's nation building. As you listen to this land acknowledgement, please join me in reflecting on the importance of being willing to unlearn stories that contain the seeds of oppression and instead make space in your minds and hearts for the complexity of truth. We acknowledge that this land was stolen from indigenous peoples. In what is now called Southern Arizona, the displacement, genocide, and theft of land occurred in successive waves of colonization by Spain, Mexico, and the United States. This colonization is still happening, and as we have seen in the last year with the building of the border wall, local tribal nations must continue to fight the destruction and misappropriation of their land by America. The Chiricahua Apache, Pascuayaki, Otum and Opata peoples are the indigenous ancestors of this land and are still our neighbors today. They are each unique in their culture and language. They are each resilient in their maintenance of traditional life ways while also engaging the present and shaping the future. If you have a chalice or a candle nearby, I welcome you to light it with me now as I say these words from Reverend J. E. Abernathy, Jr. We affirm that love is our greatest purpose. Accepting one another is the truest form of faithful living. The search for truth is our constant star. We pledge our hearts and our minds and our hands to challenge injustice with courage, to find hope in times of fear, and to live out our Unitarian Universalist values every day as a beloved community. Thus, we do covenant with each other and with all that is sacred in life.
The story today is many, many years old, and many of us have heard it frequently over the years. If this is you, I want to invite you today to try and listen to it with a fresh, open mind. As we begin our conversation this week about fake fights, in other words, talking about things we aren't talking about, I invite you to consider the question, how do we come to tell each other the truth? What do we do when we hear it? Here we go. Many years ago, there lived an emperor who loved beautiful clothing. So much so that he spent all his money on being very finely dressed. His only interest was in going to the theater or riding about in his carriage and showing off his fancy duds. He had a different costume for every hour of every day and would change frequently. Indeed, where it was said of other kings that they were at court, it could only be said of him that he was in his dressing room. One day, two swindlers or cheaters or frauds came to the emperor's city. They said that they were weavers claiming to be able to create the most beautiful cloths they knew. Not only were the colors and patterns extraordinarily beautiful, but in addition to be their beauty, these cloths had the amazing property that they were able to be invisible to anyone who was incompetent or foolish. It would be wonderful to have clothes made from that cloth, thought the emperor. Then I would know which of my people was unfit for their positions. I'd be able to tell the clever from the foolish ones. Hmm. So immediately he gave the two swindlers, the two crooks, a great sum of money to weave cloth for him. The crooks got to work. They set up their looms and pretended to go to work, although there was nothing at all on the looms. They asked for all the finest silk and the purest gold, all of which they stashed away to be able to take later. They continued to work on the empty looms long into the night. Hmm, thought the emperor. I would really like to know how they are coming with that cloth. But he was uneasy when he recalled the fact that anybody who couldn't see the cloth was either incompetent or foolish. Of course, he himself had nothing to fear, he thought. But why take the chance? He sent one of his best advisors to go see the work as it was progressing. I'll send my honest old minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He's the best one to see how the material is coming. He's very sensible, and no one is more worthy of his position than he is. So the old minister went to the hall where the two crooks were working in their empty looms. Goodness, thought the old minister, opening his eyes wide. I cannot see a thing, but he didn't say so. The two swindlers invited him to step closer, asking him if it wasn't a beautiful design and the colors magnificent and see how it flows and drapes. They pointed to the empty room and to the empty loom, and the old minister opened his wise, eyes wider and wider, for he could see nothing. Gracious, he thought, is it possible that I am foolish? I have never thought so. Am I unfit for my position? I don't know. It will never do for me to say I cannot see the material. The weavers asked, you aren't saying anything. Oh, the minister said, it is magnificent. It is the very best. Peering closely through his glasses, look at this pattern. Look at these colors. It is magnificent. I am sure the emperor will be very satisfied. Well, the two weavers said, that makes us very happy. They called the colors and unusual patterns by name. They pointed out every little thing. The old minister just listened so that he could tell the emperor. He had a plan. He was going to tell the emperor what the weaver said, and then he could claim that he saw it himself. And of course, at this point, the swindlers ask for more money, more silk, more gold, all of which they stashed away for later. The emperor sent another official the next day to observe the progress. They too were startled when they saw nothing, and they too reported back how wonderful the material was, advising the emperor to take it have it made into all of his clothes so that he could wear it in this grand procession. The entire city was alive with praise for this cloth. They all said it was magnificent. And they said this in many languages throughout the land. The emperor even awarded the swindlers with medals of honor, bestowing on each of them the title Lord Weaver. 
The swindlers stayed up the entire night before the this big procession was to take place, burning more than 16 candles, which was evidently a lot of candles. Everyone could see they were in a great rush to finish the emperor's new clothes. They pretended to take material off the looms and they pretended to cut it with an air of great drama and they pretended to sew it into beautifully fitting clothes. Finally, they announced, behold, the clothes are finished. The emperor then came to the weavers with his most distinguished advisors. The two swindlers raised their arms as they were holding something and said, look at these trousers. Here's the jacket. This is the cloak and so forth. They're as light as spider webs. You might think you didn't have anything on, but that is the good thing about them. Yes, said the advisors. Yes, yes, but they couldn't see a thing either. Would his imperial majesty, said the weavers, remove his clothes and we will fit you with the new ones here in front of this large mirror. The emperor took off all of his old shabby clothes and the swindlers pretended to dress him piece by piece with the new ones as they were being fitted. They took a hold of his waist and pretended to tie something about it. They took a hold of his shoulders and pretended to tie something about his shoulders. Goodness, they suit you well. What a wonderful fit, the swindler said. The advisor said, what a pattern, such glorious color, such beautiful clothes. The canopy to be carried above your head waits outside, said the grand master of ceremonies. I am ready, said the emperor. Don't they fit well? He turned once again towards the mirror because it had to appear as though he were admiring himself and all his glory. The assistants who were to carry the train that ran behind the king, the emperor, held their hands up just above the floor as if they were picking up the train. They walked and they pretended to hold the train high, for they could not let anyone notice they could see nothing. The emperor walked beneath the beautiful canopy in the procession. All the people in the streets and all the people leaning out their windows said, goodness, the emperor's new clothes are incomparable. What a beautiful train on this jacket. What a perfect fit. No one wanted it to be noticed that they could see nothing, for then it would be said that they were either unfit for their position or foolish. None of the emperor's clothes had ever received such high praise. But but he doesn't have anything on, said a small child. Good Lord, let us hear the voice of an innocent child, said the father, and whispered to another what this child had said. A small child has said he doesn't have anything on. A small child has said he doesn't have anything on. Finally, everyone sang, he doesn't have anything on. The emperor shuddered, for he knew they were right, and he thought, the procession must go on. He carried himself even more proudly, and the chamberlains and the advisors walked around long behind him, carrying a train that wasn't there. So when you hear this story, when you experience this story, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, what do you hear? What do you hear about our fake fights, about the things that we don't say to each other? How did the people in the story share their truths with each other and not? Who in the story was able to hear the truth when it came out? And what did they do with it? Who wasn't able to hear the truth? We all have times in our lives when we play a role in this story. We're the emperor who doesn't want to see the invisible clothes and that they're being tricked. We're the child who has a truth to tell, and we're not sure who's going to hear that truth. Maybe we're the advisors, and it's very important to us not to let people know that we think maybe we're incompetent, or maybe we're being foolish, or maybe we don't agree with what somebody who has more power than us is saying. What do we do? What do we do in those times? What do you do when you have a truth to share with others? Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear. And the children will smile without wondering whether on that day dark new clouds will appear. Wait and see, wait and see what a world there can be if we share. You and
Shana Haba Neshebel Hamer Peset Venis Porti Pori Mondedor Viladim Behusha Isaha Kuto Feset Ben Haba It Leven Hasador O Tire O Tire Kamatovi Bashana, Bashana, Haba, Altire, Altire, Kamatovi, Bashana, Bashana, Haba. Some have dreamed, some have died to make a bright tomorrow, and our vision remains in our hearts. Now the torch must be passed. With Hope not in sorrow and a promise to make a new start. We can see, we can see what a world there can be if we share, if we care, you and me. We can see, we can see what a world there can be if we share, if we care, you and me. Oh, Bashana, Bashana, Haba, O Tire, O Tire, Kamatovi, Bashana, Bashana. Hear these words from Starhawk Community means strength. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only catch glimpses of from time to time. Community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter the room. Voices will celebrate with us as we come into our own power. Community means strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter a circle of healing, a circle of friends. Somewhere we can be free. We're back. We're back. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey. We're back here introducing our next series, which is on UU taboos. Ooh. Ooh. Um, 
And we're going to be talking in the series, each of us is going to be taking on a Yu Yu taboo, the fake fight that is, that taboo yeah. encourages. Um, and then what we think is actually under that taboo and that fake fight, the real talk about what actually is going on um, in those in those things. And the fake fight idea is inspired by Nancy McDonald Ladd, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd, who's based out of Bethesda, Maryland. And she, um, in a sermon at General Assembly, distri- described a fake fight in this way. She says, a fake fight about the bylaws in our annual meeting is most often a carefully concealed real fight about the values that undergird our history, coming into relationship with the values that may undergird our future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we can get past duking it out over, for example, the paint color in the church bathroom, we may encounter a pastoral window into the inner life of one whose voice in the world seems increasingly powerless. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we just love this idea of, of figuring out what are the fake fights that happen across our congregations, across many congregations and communities, and how can we begin to recognize what's actually under those fake fights and those taboos? Mm. You know, did you, any of you encounter that biblical scholar Walter Wink somewhere mm-hmm. in... Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, just, it reminds me of his uh, his observations that um, churches have angels, uh, and in fact, that's that's written into Christian scripture. Um, but that when you ignore those deeper values uh, and they're allowed to not be addressed and you know dealt with, uh, they become demonic. Um, for me, that's a shorthand kind of metaphorical way to look at the exact same thing we're addressing over the next month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I was an intern with a really, really great youth minister, he said, parents do not like talking about death, sex, and money. So if you're willing to talk about any of those topics with their children, they're actually really uh, happy. I'm going to uh, spare right. you the death and sex talk today. But my taboo is money. That's a hard one. And it's a really hard one in churches. How often do you have people just lining up to help with a stewardship campaign? And I think part of that, the fake fight under all that is, you know, how do we do it appropriately? How do we talk about it well? We even come up with fake words like, please share your treasure. And, um, And so really, I think it's important to face the anxiety and face the harder, but perhaps really healthy, life-giving conversation underneath, which might be more about class, something we don't like to talk about as Americans Mm -hmm. and as you use. Um, Unitarian Universalism has a rich history of different class classes going on in different ways that we don't always acknowledge. And as a country, we don't want to talk about the the fact that the American dream might not be open to everyone. So can we be from different classes? Can we be all together? Don't we want to be egalitarian? What does the first principle say to us and how are we attacking it? If we go deeper and look at some of the ways this plays out in our churches, And so we can address it more healthily. One way we uh, have a fake fight is over economic justice. Isn't it just an issue we deal with outside? Maybe some of our churches have people who might need some support inside. So there's a healthy reason to face face the money talk. And Mm -hmm. um, I will be inviting you to that Mm -hmm. in the second part of our second uh, go round in our series. Yeah, and the week after that, the taboo I'm taking on is authority. Um, who gets to make the decisions, right? How many times have we each heard that in our congregations? And the stereotype around this that we sometimes laugh about, but sometimes actually fight about is paint colors, right? What color do we paint this yeah. thing? Um, each of our congregations in its history has a story about fighting over paint colors. So that's the stereotype um, of the the fake fight that we have. But as Nancy McDonald Ladd says, we fight about our bylaws. We fight about just seemingly small things. Um, And the taboo, I think, is authority. um, Because when we have the real talk about authority, when we unravel that question of who gets to make the decisions, we find that it's wrapped up in um, 
How do we embody power and responsibility that comes with authority? How do we trust mm -hmm. the authority we give to others? Mm -hmm. And then also, how do we encourage a practice of recognizing one another's gifts to our communities? Um, gifts for the authority we bring. And I'll share a, a quick story of a congregation that I knew well at one point in time um, that many years ago, 40 years ago or so, was having a congregation uh, conversation, an annual meeting about changing its name. Mm -hmm. The church is named after um, a, a white person, a white minister in its history. And that minister mm -hmm. had been dead for at least 100 years. Um, and they thought, maybe it's about time to change the name of our congregation. Um, so they were in the sanctuary having this con this conversation at annual meeting, and um, an elder in the congregation, much respected by so many people, um, got up and said, you will change the name of this church over my dead body, basically, is what she said. Oh. And she sat back down, yeah. and then about 30 minutes later, she died right in the sanctuary. She had a heart attack and died. And her family members were still in the congregation and would come and tell this to the story to me. But there was still in the system this, like, we can't change our name. We can't even have a conversation about changing our name. Even newcomers learned very quickly that if you wanted to mention changing the church's name, you had to do it in the hushed corner of the fellowship hall or in a place where, you know, there weren't a lot of people <sighs> listening. And so because the congregation still has the authority to change their name, mm -hmm. but because there was this um, incredible story about that authority <clears throat> being questioned or challenged, um, they, for 40 years, couldn't have an open conversation about what it would mean to lean into that authority to decide their own name. Mm -hmm. So when we don't um, acknowledge the taboo of authority in our congregations, we can get stuck, and it can lead us to not take action that perhaps, or have conversations that would be really valuable to have. Mm. Wow. Well, I mean, a story that I know we're all familiar with in the Baja Force, something we're going to reveal to you all in our community. You should know that behind the scenes, when we put together our series and we're working through what music to, to sing together, what poetry to read together, or what should the sermon say, there's often a moment where we ask ourselves, is there too much God in that? <laughs> and we all pause and we check how many times yeah. is God mentioned and <laughs> is it more Christian or not? And did this group get acknowledged or not? Yeah. And we have this whole moment where we have to, to this is the taboo, right? Mm -hmm. Are we working with this thing that is so common in UU congregations around language? So I'm thinking I'm God, church, worship, ooh, <laughs> prayer, soul. Amen. Spirit, sacred, you know, holy. So these all are words that are charged in our congregations. And so the kind of the real talk beneath the score sheet of who got acknowledged and what sacred language got used uh, are some deeper roots. And some of the things that I think we'll explore on that Sunday in particular are, is actually what are we not talking about? So one thing we're not talking about is the reality of religious trauma and religious abuse. And the reality for some of us that some of these words that we use um, were actually weaponized at one point mm -hmm. and that those mm -hmm. that it's weaponizing true. left yeah. scars. And so every time some of us hear these words, what pulses in us is the wound, the scar yeah. of the way that got weaponized. And so the work for some of us is around how do we attend to the scarring um, and then communally, how do we support each other in healing what really got hurt? But the other thing we're not talking about is the fact that some of these words are doorways to feeling at home in the world. So some of us have these words and they really mean something and they mean something important yeah. um, that we can't let go of. And I think about any of us who've ever experienced being in a place where our language is not the dominant language. And you're trying to figure out maybe it was when you were traveling or maybe uh, English is a second language for you. And you're trying to find a way to speak and nothing gets met. And that feeling you have in your body when someone says a word that you recognize mm -hmm. and the way that your body just relaxes, like, mm -hmm. ah, that word, that word, I don't have to try so hard with. Mm -hmm. And so... Of course, the reality is that both of this exists in our congregations. And for many of us, probably 
both of those exist in just one body um, at a one time. And so the, the threat is that we think, okay, well, uh, we have to find the one word that we're all okay with. <laughs> um, and if we could just find the one word that we're all okay with, then we'll just use that word and we'll avoid all these words that create problems. Um, of course, that would feel a little bit like all of us in our congregations trying to pick like the one pizza we're going to eat. It would be deeply <laughs> unsatisfying. Uh, and so the issue isn't really like, what's the one thing that we're all going to get connected to? Rather, yeah. the, the real talk underneath that is how do we become multilingual? Mm -hmm. How do we actually come to love and embrace multiple words, including multiple realities about those words and live in one community together? Mm -hmm. And then are we the richer uh, for it? Yeah. Well, I love what you say about, uh, and I'm looking forward to that Sunday, um, to see um, how we begin to learn to be multilingual so that we get that feeling. Um, the week afterwards, I will be following up um, and working with our Baja 4 team to create a worship um, that is about being embodied because that really becomes the taboo um, that uh, I'm going to address. And um, how so many times in our in-person worship, um, we don't move. Uh, we may get a little bit of that language, and I love that idea of the feeling when you've been heard and it's resonating. Mm -hmm. um, but when are we actually embodied? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that we fight over it in as much as we don't engage. Mm -hmm. And that means we're leaving out so much of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so the worship that um, I'll be working with all of us to create really is um, about how we move. Um, and even um, who inspires us to find joy and pleasure uh, in the work that we do together, in the ministry and in the justice work. Um, so I will certainly be bringing up one of my favorite, it's kind of my uh, social activist crush, uh, Adrian Marie Brown. <laughs> we, we I know, know. everybody. We know, Matt. Everybody. <laughs> Adrian Marie Brown, Reverend Matthew loves you wherever you are. Yeah, big, big, very much so. Uh, and her uh, astounding uh, work, uh, not just in one particular uh, book, but in just how she is, is so embodied mm -hmm. in everything that uh, I have encountered that she does. Um, so hopefully we'll be, I mean, I'll be looking ways to us to sing and dance and you know, enjoy the pleasure of our own bodies um, in worship. Um, and maybe that includes um, just the clothes we wear, um, the way that we can even just, you know, hold and touch our own uh, bodies. Um, and we'll be looking for all of that uh, together. Wow, I'm really excited. I'm excited that we're doing taboos together <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I, one thing that's also exciting at the end of our time is we will be celebrating approximately on march 21st one year of baja for collaborative worship so on March 21st, that Sunday, it's going to be a celebration Sunday of one year of interdependence. Uh, and it'll also be celebrating some transitions, people who are coming and going for different reasons, yeah. new things being born into the world. Uh, and we will also, yes, perhaps, <laughs> um, we'll be honoring what we've created together and this idea that we've really hung to and fostered which is that we are stronger together than apart, including Amen. strong enough Amen. to take on Amen. taboos. So I'm glad we'll do that together and I'm glad everyone will join us. Yay. Me too. Me too.
Sometimes we don't notice the pervasive culture that we participate in. People refer to this as being like a fish not noticing the water in which they swim. We are so invested in the narratives and systems of our culture and subcultures that we forget that there are many other ways to be. This shows up on every level in society, in our family and friend groups, and in our congregations. Sometimes it can be hard to imagine or want to face the ways that we exist as a culture and to consider those boundaries and how we want, might want to redraw those lines. But sometimes we are not fish. We are creatures of dry land. If you would, please join me in imagining a pool or lake. Perhaps you are on the shore or perhaps you are on a boat floating on the water. The surface of the water is calm and an occasional breeze stirs ripples on the surface. Let those ripples catch your attention. So often, when something is challenging in our relationships or communities, it is hard to see the whole challenge, but we see the ripples on the surface. Imagine a stronger wind blowing across the water. Notice how the ripples sometimes turn into waves. Sometimes a situation is comfortable and calm. Other times it is demanding and insistent like a strong wind. We see the surface of the water change from stillness to ripples to big waves. But as long as we are paying attention only to the surface, we still haven't heard the underlying truth. When you look at this pond in your mind's eye, I invite you to try feeling curious about the water and curious about what there is to learn under the surface. We will need curiosity to explore below the surface of our taboos in the coming weeks. Maybe you also feel nervous or scared or hesitant when you think about what is under the surface of the water. That is totally okay. Learning how to swim and dive deep is not easy. That is why we are doing this together so that we can share our learning with each other and support each other. As we prepare to dive deep, I offer this quote from Machona Luayo. A fish only begins to realize its potential the moment you throw it in deep waters. We are fish, fully immersed in our cultural waters. And even though there are depths we do not often go into, we also remember that because we are fish, we can swim.
Our closing words come from the Reverend Elizabeth Nguyen. Spirit, I would really rather not learn this. Didn't think I needed to. I thought someone else could do it. Thought a leader was coming to do it. Thought the young people could do it, or the elders could do it, or the professionals. Or, I don't want to learn it because it means letting go of something I hold dear. Letting go of being someone who knows the answers. Letting go of being someone who doesn't know. Letting go of the way I see the world. Letting go of how I might have to change. Letting go of certainty of logic, of facts of control, or the myth that you can live on this earth and not harm, or the myth that I can't learn anything new. Help me learn it, please. And then help me to live what I have learned. And do right by the gift of being taught. I extinguish our chalice today with these words from the Reverend J. Wolin. Are we a people of holding on or of letting go? Holding on to rigid ideas or letting go and opening our minds and our hearts to something new, holding on to certainty of how things should be or letting go and living with the uncertainty of new ways of being in the world, holding on to what makes us comfortable or letting go so we may grow which can be uncomfortable. I extinguish this chalice, these words from the Reverend J. Wolf, called Letting Go. Are we a people of holding on or of letting go? Holding on to rigid ideas or letting go and opening our minds and our hearts to something new. Holding on to certainty of how things should be or letting go and living with the uncertainty of new ways of being in the world. Holding on to what makes us comfortable or letting go so we may grow which can be uncomfortable, holding on to what makes us safe, or letting go to make room to help others feel safe. With this flame, this symbol of our religion, let it be a symbol of burning up the ties that hold us back from being our true self and reaching our true potential, let it be a symbol of lighting a new way for all of us into a better tomorrow. And let it be a symbol of letting go. Because holding on too long and too tightly is never good for the soul.